Um, and I want to let you know a little bit about our uh, presenter tonight. Uh, Jeremy Beer is the author or editor of eight books and dozens of articles, essays, and reviews on sports, philanthropy, politics, and culture in outlets such as the Washington Post, Commonweal, National Review, and the Utney Reader. His award-winning Oscar Charleston, The Life and Legend of Baseball's Greatest Forgotten Player, was published by the University of Nebraska Press in November 2019. Jeremy is the co-founder and principal partner at American Philanthropic. Excuse me. He holds a doctorate in psychology from the University of Texas at Austin and lives in Phoenix, Arizona with his wife, Kara. So we're certainly happy to have you here, Jeremy. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. It's very nice to be here. I've never uh, been uh, in your neck of the woods, and I hope that the situation allows for me to do so at some point soon. So it's nice that I can visit in this uh, online way and, and talk with you all uh, tonight. So thanks, thanks for having me. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Oscar Charleston and, and why I think he is worthy of being remembered and, and then take questions. I, I won't talk for, I don't think I'll talk for more than 30 minutes. I'll certainly try not to, especially since I'm just going to be talking sort of into the void here with all of you muted, but we should have plenty of time for questions uh, and I'm happy to answer anything I, I can. Uh, the big thing I would have you take away uh, from this uh, talk is that history is an unjust judge. Uh, that's not just true of Oscar Charleston, it's true of a lot of people. And there, there are many neglected, unjustly neglected figures, not just from the world of baseball or sports, but from all walks of life that await uh, to be rediscovered and have been um, forgotten uh, um, uh, without uh, just cause. Uh, Charleston, for his part, may have put together the greatest uh, resume in baseball history, overall resume in baseball history. I'll try to defend that claim in tonight's uh, talk. Certainly one of the greatest careers in the history of American sport, uh, and he is all but entirely forgotten. Uh, if you didn't know his name before this uh, talk, uh, you're not alone. Uh, so I'll, I'll end by giving my thoughts on, on why that may have happened. But I'll, I'll begin just by giving you a little bit of basic background in history, just a quick thumbnail of Charleston's life and then talk about why I think he has potentially the greatest resume in baseball history. Uh, Oscar Charleston was born in Indianapolis on October 14th, 1896. His family was large and poor. He had nine brothers and sisters who survived childhood. Uh, they moved to a new rented house just about every year. Uh, and now I'm going to share my screen. I'll, I'll have a few pictures to share with you here tonight. So you don't just have to look at me the whole time. Um, so give me one second. Right here where this uh, semi-trailer is, is where Oscar was born. Uh, it's gone now. There's no plaque. There's no anything. This is on the near east side in Indianapolis. Other just pictures of nothingness, basically. All the 10 or more houses in which Charleston and his family lived as a boy are gone, thanks to urban renewal, um, which may not have renewed much, but it certainly destroyed a lot in, in Indianapolis's historic black neighborhoods. Um, but uh, Oscar was a bat boy uh, sometime in his early teens, we know that, uh, and he was a bat boy for the best black baseball team in the city of Indianapolis, the Indianapolis ABCs. Of course, there was no such thing as high school baseball uh, for a black youth at that time, at least in Indianapolis. Uh, so with money tight, as I said, his family was always quite poor. Oscar lied his way into the army after he finished the eighth grade. He was 15 years old. Uh, he was shipped to the Philippines. And within a year or two, he got his start in professional baseball in the Philippines, playing for the 24th Infantry's baseball team. The 24th Infantry was an all-black unit. Uh, and they were admitted into the Manila League, <clears throat> so semi-pro league in Manila in the Philippines, um, equivalent to sort of like a low A minor league team uh, today. Uh, and Oscar played on that team. That's where he got his start. There was um, there were two uh, all white teams. There was a all native Filipino team and the 24th Infantry team. And he uh, and uh, another man on his team named Wilbur Rogan, who went on to be known as Bullet Joe Rogan. Uh, there were two future Hall of Famers on that 24th Infantry team. So he got a start there in 1914, and he actually played for an, all, uh, an all-star team 
uh, that was integrated uh, then in 1914 in the Philippines. So 34 years before Jackie Robinson integrated the majors, Oscar Charleston was playing for an integrated baseball team in the Philippines. When he got his discharge in 1915, he headed home to Indianapolis, got a tryout with the ABCs, made the team, and was a star within just a couple of years. He moved around quite a bit in the Negro Leagues over the next 20 plus years. And I'll just show you some pictures here uh, of him with various teams. Uh, here he is with the Indianapolis ABCs as a very young man. And over on the side here, which I can't quite get to because this is Oscar right here with the Homestead Grays. To look myself. Um, here he is with the teammate on the Harrisburg Giants later. Here he is in Cuba with the famous team, the Santa Clara Leopardos. He played um, uh, throughout the 1920s. He played every winter in Cuba uh, on some very famous teams. Also played for the Pittsburgh Crawfords uh, and a few other teams as well. That says a lot about the Negro Leagues right there. And I can explain why there was so much fluid player movement if anybody's interested. Um, as his playing days wound down in the late 1930s, he devoted himself to managing. Every year except two, from that time until his death in 1954, he coached, managed, or umpired in the Negro Leagues. And in 1976, he was inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, he isn't just a Hall of Famer. He belongs in the elitist of the elite circles of the Hall of Fame. Because as I said, he, he may have had baseball's best overall resume. So why do I say that? Uh, there are four reasons I would give you. The first is that Charleston is one of the finest players ever to play the game. And I'll present some of the evidence to that effect. The second is he's one of the greatest managers in Negro Leagues history. It's not too often we see that in the history of the sport where someone is also is a great manager as well as a great player. Oscar was both by all accounts. He was also third, probably the first African-American to be paid to scout for a major league team. He broke the scouting color line, I believe. Um, no one had ever really kind of made that claim before. I've been making it, no one has corrected me, so I'm gonna keep making it until somebody presents evidence to the contrary. And fourth, of course, he did all of this while competing under the exceptionally difficult circumstances and conditions of Jim Crow America and segregation. And his toughness and his success made him very, very popular and gave hope and pride to millions of black Americans during his career. So let me elaborate a little on each of these reasons before uh, I end by giving a few reasons why Charleston has been so forgotten. Finest, the finest player claim. So by the consensus of his peers, black and white, uh, Oscar was the greatest all-around player in black baseball beginning in the late teens and throughout the 1920s. And I'll just digress here quickly. I said black and white. You may not know, because many people don't know, that black teams played against white teams all the time in pre-integration baseball America. Uh, they played after the regular season. They played before the regular season. Sometimes they even played during the season. So there were a lot of contests against one another. And white players, white scouts, white managers, coaches, umpires, all had a chance to see how good uh, the black players were. And um, uh, they formed opinions. And uh, as we'll see in a second, many of them said Oscar was one of the greatest players, if not the greatest player they'd ever seen. Uh, Charleston was what would be called today a five tool player, if you've ever heard that um, phrase, which means he could hit for average, he could hit for power, he could run, he could field, and he could throw. He could do all of those things very well, but especially the first four. His arm was probably his weakest tool, but the first four, he was completely elite. No one had ever seen anyone play center field as well as he did. That's how he first became famous in the black game. Um, he played a very, very shallow center field. People said it was like he was just behind second base, uh, and it was very hard to hit a ball over his head because he was so fast and had such great range. He was also an early master of the one-handed catch. You might, may not think that's a very big deal. Everybody catches a ball with one hand these days, but they didn't 100 plus years ago. Why is that? Because their mitts, mitts weren't like this. They were like this, just as big as your hand, right? With no padding um, or very little padding. 
Oscar had incredibly strong hands and is very, very athletic. So one of the things that's commented on all the time in the press is how he caught the ball one-handed. This was considered quite amazing. He was such a good hitter and he was so fast that early in his career, he was routinely compared to Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker. This was about the highest praise that the sports press of the time could confer on anyone. Later, as he added power, he was more commonly compared to Babe Ruth. Uh, obviously about the highest praise the press could confer on anyone. Um, and then, as I said, the testimonials of his peers, uh, no one has, at least in, in the Negro Leagues, has this sort of collection of testimonials to their greatness, uh, except perhaps Josh Gibson, if we're talking about position players. Um, I've circled over here on the right, uh, a quote from Honus Wagner, disappeared in the Pittsburgh Courier just before or just after Oscar died, I think it was just before, in 1954. Uh, Wagner saying that he had never seen a player greater than Oscar Charleston. Buck O'Neill, who you may know from Ken Burns' documentary in baseball and other places, um, said that Willie Mays was the greatest player he'd ever seen in Major League Baseball, but Charleston was the greatest he'd ever seen, period. Um, number of other quotes here. The one that's worth mentioning perhaps is Tom Baird. He was the white co-owner of the Kansas City Monarchs. It turns out that Tom Baird was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Yet he didn't let that keep him from saying that Charleston was the greatest ball player that ever lived. So he could even impress real out and out racist uh, with how good a player he was. So we have a, a much, much testimony to how good Charleston was. Uh, it's worth noting that Bill James, have you ever heard of him, the great baseball writer and historian, father of advanced statistics, uh, ranked Charleston the fourth greatest player of all time uh, when he looked at the evidence about 20 years ago. And Joe Posnanski, another a contemporary baseball writer today, writing in The Athletic earlier this year, ranked Charleston the fifth greatest player of all time. So we're talking about somebody who's right there with Ruth and Mays, Cobb, Bonds, uh, Ted Williams, Mantle, anybody you might want to mention. Um, I will not, uh, I promise, because I don't know how interested people are in this kind of thing, I won't dwell on this, but just a little bit on statistics. Um, we do have actually pretty good Negro League statistics. That's sort of a myth that probably needs to be exploded now is that we don't, we do. Uh, the a army of voluntary researchers has gone through old newspapers and scoured and found box scores and we compiled the stats. We have better stats now than they had at the time, uh, probably. Well, I know we do in terms of what's been published. And uh, from those statistics, we can see that Charleston, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, has the most of the following in Negro League's history, the most played appearances at bats, runs, hits, doubles, triples, RBIs, stolen bases, and walks and he's third in home runs. Um, he would have been a, what I would call a 300, 300, 300 player. Uh, there's every reason to believe he would have compiled a career uh, statistics of at least a batting average of 300, at least 300 home runs and at least 300 stolen bases had he had the opportunity to play with whites in the major leagues. Um, nobody's ever done that before. So he was really unique, one of a kind player. Uh, I really don't see any reason not to accept Buck O'Neill's statement that he was essentially Willie Mays before Willie Mays. Uh, in terms of today's game, I often say he's kind of like a left-handed Mike Trout, even in the way he was built. He was kind of very kind of like a linebacker like Mike Trout. So um, that's some of the evidence for that. It, it's worth noting that unfortunately, Charleston's reputation for having a temper has overshadowed his abilities at times in the baseball literature. Um, if you encounter that kind of statement, I would just caution you, it's, it's, it's pretty exaggerated. He was tough. He was intensely competitive. He got into fights on the field, never got into fights off the field. But he got into fights on the field, often, more often joining fights in progress because he liked to fight. He was a big boxing fan, for instance. He liked to fight. <laughs> he was good at it. Um, but he, there were a lot of fights in baseball at the time, is my point. The context is really important. There were Every season in baseball 100 years ago, we see hundreds of fights, often involving umpires, uh, sometimes involving fans. So uh, you have to keep that context in mind. Charleston probably got in more than his share, but not that many more than his share. Oh, how, if you read, when I got into this biography, I thought I was going to find that Charleston was sort of a borderline thug, maybe some kind of psychopath, the way he's described in some of the literature. And I found out that is entirely not the case. 
Uh, he was very popular among uh, not just fans, but teammates and, and owners. He's charming, charismatic, friendly, jolly is one word used to de describe him. A beautiful personality is how one ex Negro Leagues player described him to me. Um, so he was just the kind of guy you wanted on your team. He was military tough and intensely competitive. And uh, he was constantly recruited by black owners because um, of how great he was to have on your team and have as a leader of your team. So that's, that's my evidence for um, him being one of the finest players of all time. I'll shift to the second reason why he may have the greatest overall resume in baseball history, which is he was a great manager. Um, Charleston became a manager at the age of 27 uh, when he was named the player manager of the Harrisburg Giants. Of course, most managers then, not all, but most were player managers. Um, he would later manage the Hilldale Club, which was a club outside Philadelphia, the Pittsburgh Crawfords, the Indianapolis, or the Philadelphia Stars, and the Indianapolis Clowns. He won four black baseball championships as a manager. He was voted the best manager in Negro League's history by a poll of players, the only poll of players I've ever seen on the subject. It's possible there are others, uh, but the players named him the greatest manager in, in black baseball history. And he really earned his stripes with the Crawfords. That's a team he's most associated with, uh, based in Pittsburgh, uh, a team that Oscar really built almost from scratch with uh, Gus Greenlee's money. Gus Greenlee was the owner of the team. Uh, Satchel Paige, Josh Gibson, Cool Papa Bell, Judy Johnson, Judd Wilson, those are all Hall of Fame players, as it turned out, were on the Crawfords, as well as many other talented players. Charleston really formed them into a team. He was credited with the players on that team for forming them into a true team and led them to several championships. It's worth noting that anyone who had the task of managing Satchel Paige earned his pay. If you know anything about Paige, he wasn't the easiest guy to manage. He had a, uh, um, a reputation for being somewhat unreliable in terms of showing up for games and that sort of thing and jumping contracts. He and Charleston had diametrically opposed personalities and it, did, it, it wore on Charleston after a while. But one of the coolest things I discovered from 1942 to 1944, Charleston played for and managed an integrated baseball team. Uh, this is the, for the players on the team right here. Of course, Charleston is in front significantly in this picture that appeared in the uh, Black Philadelphia Press uh, and that Charleston pasted into his own scrapbook and photo album. He's very proud of this, I think. This team represented the Quartermaster Depot in Philadelphia uh, during World War II. That's where Charleston worked during the war. And they played in the semi-pro industrial league in Philadelphia. Uh, organized baseball wouldn't get so-called organized baseball. Wouldn't get its first black manager until 1967. And that was in the minor leagues in Batavia, New York. So this is 25 years before that. Uh, how many other African-Americans had managed an integrated team in America uh, before 1942? I don't know of any. It's possible that there were some but this is yet another way in which Charleston was a pioneer in the game. Third reason why uh, Charleston may have compiled the best overall resume in baseball history was he may have been the first black scout, as I said before. <clears throat> so I have to tell you a little bit of story about this to, to make clear what happened. Um, something called the United States League was formed in 1945. Gus Greenlee, who I mentioned earlier, the owner of the Crawfords back in the 30s, um, wanted to get back into the game. He thought he could compete and wanted to compete for various personal reasons against the Negro National League and the Negro American League. And so his idea was to form a new league and to put teams in all, um, all the teams to play in uh, major league stadiums. Uh, they play a, a bigger schedule and he had all these ways he was going to make black baseball better. It struck people as sort of a weird idea in 1945 because it was clear the integration was or should be right around the corner. Um, but he went forward and here's Oscar signing his contract to sign in the league. Um, well, uh, Branch Rickey gets involved. Uh, the leaders of the United States League go to uh, Rickey in Brooklyn and they ask if they can place a team in Brooklyn and would he be involved with the league somehow? And he says, yes, because Rickey sees two advantages. One is uh, money was never far from Rickey's mind. And if he could rent out Ebbets Field, uh, for a Negro Leagues games while the Dodgers were out of town. That was just great. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it your asset sit 
uh, unused, not the way Ricky thought. But the second reason was he was in the midst of trying to sign black players for the Dodgers. Uh, as we know, Jackie Robinson signed in 1945, late 1945, and he had a problem. His scouts couldn't really get into Negro Leagues games without drawing attention to themselves, and he didn't want to draw attention to his plan to sign black players for the Dodgers. So if he had a team in Brooklyn playing at Ebbets Field that he kind of had a stake in, they were called the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers, um, then his scouts had an excuse to be out looking at Negro Leagues players because they could be scouting them for the Brown Dodgers rather than the white Major League Dodgers. So he brings Charleston up to manage the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. And here is Oscar in his Dodgers uniform. You can see they're exactly the same as the Major League Dodgers uniforms. They're almost exactly the same. There's, I don't know if there was about the hats. I've always been curious about that. Um, so Charleston then works as a scout for him. The idea was for him to manage the team, but to work as a scout which we know from Clyde Sukforth, who was the lead scout for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He talks about how they used Charleston to get into uh, Negro Leagues, uh, dugouts and clubhouses, find out information. We know that they leaned on him to do background work on Roy Campanella, who was a great catcher that the Dodgers signed soon after Jackie Robinson. And um, it's also likely that Charleston was involved in the signing of other players. These three in particular, I believe Charleston was very likely involved in the Dodgers signing, John Wright, Roy Partlow, and Dan Bankhead, for various reasons. They, they had relationships with Oscar, I know, either just before or just after they were with the Dodgers system. So uh, Charleston, by all, everything we can piece together, would seem to be um, the first Black Scout. Uh, later, uh, John Donaldson and Judy Johnson and others are often names among the first Black Scouts, but they don't start their work until like 1949 at the earliest. So this is 1945, I believe, excuse me, <coughs> that uh, Charleston was probably the first uh, 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 black man to work as a scout for a National League or an American League team, uh, yet he's gotten, like almost everything else in his life, no credit for that. But uh, he was a pioneer there as well. Fourth uh, thing to talk about with respect to Oscar's baseball resume is just the conditions under which it was compiled. Obviously, they were incredibly difficult. Um, I think we all know that intuitively, but when you read about uh, the Negro Leagues and what it took to succeed and, and persevere uh, under those conditions, it's really very impressive. Uh, it was not unusual for black baseball teams to play two, three, maybe even sometimes four games a day and, and travel all night to get to the next place. Uh, you had to hustle like crazy to make uh, what you could from the game uh, in, in black baseball. The travel was obviously very difficult, especially in the South, uh, but not only in the South. Uh, a number of players would testify uh, to places in the Midwest or the North as being just as bad from the perspective of um, racial epithets and insults being hurled at you from the stands and that sort of thing. But the South uh, presented other difficulties as well, just getting fed or finding a place to lodge on the road was not easy. Many a night teams, you know, would stay, uh, would sleep on the bus. They would sleep at the stadium or, you know, on the field before the next game to get a shower and a change and all that sort of thing was a luxury. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how smelly those buses were too, by the way, <laughs> by the players who played in the game. The uh, hotels were often flea bag places, lots of bed bugs. Players talk about sleeping on chairs rather than getting in the beds because they were such a nightmare. Of course, there's usually two to a bed. You didn't get a bed by yourself. So, yeah, this is the kind of thing that made it hard. It was a lot harder than it was in the white majors at the time. Um, so it makes what uh, somebody like Charleston accomplished all the more uh, impressive. The other thing is you couldn't take the stability of leagues or teams in the, in the Negro Leagues uh, for granted. Uh, a lot of fluidity, a lot of folding of teams, a lot of not meeting payroll. Um, is uh, Black teams were chronically undercapitalized. There just wasn't that much capital in the Black community, uh, which led to a lot of other uh, issues. Uh, but it was just another challenge that had to be put up with. Although I guess I should add that Negro Leagues players were generally paid pretty well. They made more per month than the average white or Black worker, probably considerably more in some cases. 
but they certainly didn't make nearly as much as their white counterparts in baseball. Of course, perhaps the most challenging thing was that you had proved that you could compete well and successfully against white major leaguers, even the best white major leaguers, and he still would not be signed by a National League or American League team. Obviously, that could be grading. Uh, Charleston did better versus major leaguers than Negro leaguers, as far as we can tell, the, the statistics that we have. And he had success against elite pitchers like Lefty Grove and Dizzy Dean, uh, who Dizzy Dean especially said a lot of nice things about Charleston, actually. Um, yet, for all that, you know, and interestingly, uh, Charleston and his peers chose not to view themselves as victims. They knew that segregation was utterly unjust, uh, to understate the fact quite a bit, and they wanted it to end. But Charleston, and Charleston once challenged a, a Yankee scout to sign him, and he was delighted after the white majors were integrated. He talked about how every player that went up, he was a manager at the time, every player that went up was made up for him to some degree. Uh, but yet while he played and while integration seemed like a distant dream, he and his peers focused on what they could control. They took risks, they worked like crazy, they persevered, and in the end, they could take legitimate pride in what they had achieved on the field with their play and in what they had achieved off the field in building up one of the country's most successful black institutions in the Negro Leagues. I was talking to Jeff about this earlier before uh, everybody got on. You know, it's, as a group, I think it's really fair to say that the men of Charleston's generation developed a depth of character uh, that is noticeable. It's almost tangible. Uh, they certainly paved the way for the generation that would later integrate baseball, the Robinson, Mays, Aaron, Banks generation. And that would pressure the rest of society to do the same. And that's what makes, of course, Oscar's story and the story of his peers a deeper one than simply a story about baseball. Uh, there's much we could learn from it. All right, I'll, I'll end here by just indicating why Oscar has been forgotten. Uh, there are just four things I would note. First, he had no kids. He was married twice. He was estranged from his second wife when he died, but he had no children from either marriage. And if you want to be remembered, it turns out having children is a really, really good strategy. Uh, he just had no one to tend the flame for him. He did have a number of living brothers and sisters, but they were very quiet. In fact, the Hall of Fame could not find anybody for a long time uh, until his sister uh, popped up at the last second to accept his um, plaque at the enshrinement in Cooperstown in 1976. Uh, so that's one reason. He died young in 1954 at the age of 57. That was fully a generation before historians got around to talking to ex-Negro Leagues players, to documenting the history of the game, to really delving into it and taking it seriously as a subject of history. Um, various reasons for that, I think. Uh, but that hurt him because he wasn't around to tell his own story. And the people who were around were of a later generation and who didn't really know him as a player as much as they did as a manager. Third, his city, Indianapolis, did not claim him. I really don't know why this is. Obviously, race plays a role, and perhaps a very big role in it. And yet, Indianapolis has claimed Oscar Robertson, the big O, a uh, great basketball player, uh, very much so. And he was born in the same neighborhood as Oscar just a generation later. So I don't, it just, it just somehow never clicked. Indianapolis, it never kind of entered and lodged himself into Indianapolis's collective brain. And the fourth thing just to note is that, hey, everyone has been forgotten from Oscar's generation among Negro League's stars. The only ones we really make room for in our minds collectively are Satchel Paige and maybe Josh Gibson and uh, maybe cool Papa Bell because he has a great nickname and Satchel Paige had a lot of great stories about him. But everybody else has pretty much been forgotten unjustly. Uh, who should, they should be thought of like Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker are, um, like Pop Lloyd, Turkey Stearns. John Donaldson, Smokey Joe Williams, Martin DeHigo, I could go on and on, Bullet Joe Rogan himself. Um, there are a lot of great players who are just as great as um, that generation from the 20s and 30s, Gehrig and Ruth and, and the rest um, that we talk about a lot and still think about a lot, uh, but they've been forgotten as well. So in that sense, Charleston really just stands in for, for all of them, that there's a lot of sort of historical archaeology we can do and enjoy and learn from these lies. So with that, I will stop blathering. I'll stop my screen share as well. And uh, happy to take questions.
Terrific. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I again thoroughly enjoyed that. I think it's a really fascinating story. I um, let me just make sure. In fact, Omar, maybe you can just uh, allow folks to unmute themselves. Um, and feel free to, if, if you do have questions, you can um, put those in the chat. Um, uh, do you want me to unmute everybody? Uh, just here, I'll actually do it. It's a now, folks, if you do want to unmute yourself and, and ask a question, I'll actually get it, it started. Um, I, um, you know, I'm struck by the fact that uh, obviously one of the common criticisms of history is that it's written by the victors, that, um, you know, that we're not always getting, obviously, the, the full, true uh, story of history. Right. Um, and I'm curious how, um, how you came upon this subject. Uh, and discovered it one that had yet to be told, um, and what that was like in terms of um, how do you, how did you track down the sources and um, you know just generally like yeah. that that's a unique kind of oftentimes there's subjects that have been covered in one way or another and now there's a new take on it or new information. Right. This almost seems like it was um, you know undiscovered. Yeah, no, good question. I mean, I would start by saying God bless Bill James. Uh, he um, has a book. It's called the um, Bill James Historical Baseball Abstract. I think I have that right. And um, that's where he gives his top 100 players of all time. And I was just reading yeah. through that. This must have been 10 years ago. And, you know, number one was Ruth of all time. I think two was Honus Wagner. I think I have that right. Number three is Willie Mays. And number four was Oscar Charleston. I was like, who the hell is Oscar Charleston? I've never heard of him. How is that possible? I thought I was a baseball fan. So that's what got me started, Jeff, on this sort of, journey and then um so i do do a little googling around and i discovered oscar charles charleston is from indianapolis and i'm from indiana oh he's a he's a fellow hoosier so this made me even more interested and also kind of pissed off that i didn't know who he was because my friends and i would sit around who are the greatest basketball players of all time from indiana who are the greatest athletes whatever and he just wasn't on our radar so that's what got me interested and then how how can you do it and this is I think answers the second part of your question, like, which is essentially why hadn't this been done. Um, it's easier to write a biography like this now than it would have been even 10 years ago and certainly 20 years ago because all the newspapers have been digitized. So, so much of this information, you can piece together Oscar's life by going through the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, the New York Amsterdam News, all the, black, the great papers of the black press as well as the white press, which actually did cover the Negro Leagues to some extent in certain cities, and all the random pieces of, that, you know, in the Joplin News in Missouri, where you find out he was in the hospital or whatever. So you could have done that without going to like 800 microfilm, <laughs> you know, uh, archives before. So the digitization really makes this possible. I, I can say that for technology. Um, that and the statistics being more available and so much better and having confidence that they're helping you tell the story. Um, I think you can do more of this now than you could have 20 years ago, I guess is the way I say it. It's easier to write this biography now than it would have been the day Oscar died. I, I think it's interesting that you're get, you give some credit there to Bill James. And I, I was struck by that fact in just the, the intro part of the book that I, I've read so far in that um, he, he took the kind of baseball world um, uh, he th sort of threw them for a loop because he, he was basically looking at, um, you know, rating baseball players with his own set of right formulas, system, you know, his, yeah. his own system. And it upended the kind of historically popular right. uh, rating system so that it really did focus on, um, you know, who helped their teams win the most. Right. That's right. that was kind of almost the bottom line. He would look at the statistics yeah. in that way. And I think yeah. it illustrates just what you've pointed out, which is that, Oscar Charleston was that, you know, that he, he fit that yeah. description. Yeah, a very Bill James kind of player because he brought value in so many ways. Like James is the one who showed us um, in many ways just how important defense was or at least relative to offense, for instance, and, and base running and all the ways a player can be like walks, you know, is a big deal to James. And so, yeah, I think Charleston kind of hit the sweet spot for him in a number of ways. You know, the first edition of that abstract, James didn't rate Negro Leagues players. That was the other thing, because he, he has to have stats. Like, he's not going to do anything if he doesn't have some numbers behind it, I think. And But by the time he did the second edition, he thought he had good enough statistics to rate players. And, you know, he, he immediately cross-examines himself in that book. He's like, am I being 
you know, sentimental? Am I being politically correct? He wouldn't want anybody to think he was being those things. That's very much not James. And um, it's like, no, I, he's thinking about it. Like, think how good the first black players were who entered after integration. Like, there's like a five, 10 year period when they, the best of the Negro Leagues, you know, were filtering in and they were, they crushed it. Like, so how hard, so why wouldn't we believe that before 1947, there were as many, you know, proportionally as many good players in the, in the Negro Leagues as there were in the white majors. So I think he makes a very strong case that um, just a purely as, as rational and objective as you can be, um, the very best Negro Leagues players should be rated very highly. And Charleston's probably the best of those, of that group.